So today is October 3rd, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata Extinctionati. Uh, first, we'll do a roll call of, of all our contacts. So I have scheduled, um, once I get it confirmed, I'm supposed to meet with uh, Derek Jensen on Tuesday, but I haven't heard back. I told him that I you and Sophie are available to talk but uh, I haven't gotten a reply, so I'll send one last email to Heather, and then I'll include you, uh, Hugh, and Sophie in the email. So if it's a go, then we'll do the conversation. But um, other than that, uh, uh, nothing else from me. Now, um, I haven't heard back from Paul Kings North, and that's about three weeks, two or three weeks now, so um, nothing. I haven't, I've had no replies to the more than 20 emails I sent to uh, the different uh, probation offices in the UK to see would they be interested in facilitating a, a meeting with the Extinction Rebellion. So for their, well, not for them, not the probation officers, but the people they work with. So nothing on that line either. Um, what else? Oh yeah, I said I got a message from uh, I got an email from Darren. Um, I'll I'll forward it if you like to everybody, but it was a bit uh, just to say that uh, he's um, that was not personal really. He was inviting readers to fill a survey, and uh, I did it for the crack to see what happened. And um, his blog has started again, so I, I'll send it around on a on a group email, and you can. Do what you like with it, uh, but I'm I'm com I continue to give him news to stay in touch, and he hasn't really, you know, the me the message I sent about that we'd like to help him and all that. He didn't reply to that, but he's just stayed in touch. So we just played by ear that way. Um, that's all I have to to say, and I'm I'm happy to record the mic on Tuesday, if Derek, if if Derek um, is there. Okay. Thanks. So, so is Darren kind of retiring? It kind of sounded like he was going to take a break or something. Or, or, or scale back? Or yeah, like yeah. That. that's what he was saying, because he's doing... My blog has just started up again. I'm doing three more months, and then almost nothing more. Just an occasional essay, if I feel the need. So there you go. So, so yeah, it, it looks like he's... Uh, is stepping back a bit. Mm. Mm. Everybody seems to be stepping back. <laughs> it's, it's terrible. We we haven't heard anything from Melville for any. Uh, uh, I don't think Petra has made much progress on any of those. You know, Alison or any of the transhumanists. Anti-transhumanists. Wow, we're not making much headway. What what should we do? You mean what should we do in terms of uh, inviting people for interviews or for the 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 project we have with with the uh, Roger and and the Arg? Yeah. Just getting the project along or moving things along because it's uh, kind of stalled. Is yeah, 
Faulty is a bit, uh, kind of out to lunch. She's, uh, you know, obviously got too much on his plate. So I just got one or, or two emails. Um, so yeah, I work with, with Lionel a bit to try and get a, um, what do you call a response video, a takedown video or whatever. Um, uh, so yeah, but I haven't finished that. So um, yeah, I haven't heard a lot from anything. So I was just wondering, it's just kind of seems really static. <laughs> I wonder what we should do, get a bit of life into it. Well, we are we are at a point where we were. I was just talking to Mike earlier about this. We we were going up up until July, and then things started to to stop because we didn't get positive responses from the West Coast crew who did the arg that we liked, and we also uh, lost touch a bit with 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 Roger Hallam because of that Insulate Britain campaign that they were doing after you travel there. So we've been about two months really with. Um, yeah, do we have to go to a, in to another direction, looking for art directors? Do we have to do some ourselves? Do do we have to stop relying on 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 that that arg that's pre existing and revive the one that you started? <laughs> or I I I'm not an expert in that kind of I don't think I'm an artist either. Or, but I I I'd be happy to to discuss that with people who are. I've met with an art director recently. But, well, what does everybody want to do? What, where does everybody want to take it? I mean, where's the, what's the feeling what we should should do in general? Because, yeah, I, I kind of feel there's a few things waiting in the wings, like uh, I think there's probably going to be a little winter of discontent coming. I think the financial markets and there might be a financial meltdown. So I've got a feeling, you know, energy crunch, few, it's going to be a, maybe a rough winter. So how do people want to handle it? Well, I think one thing we could do is we could be um, able to provide some context around some of the, the events that come for people. Um, so if, if there's a, you know, if people are feeling a little bit uh, down about, you know, the their their hopes being dashed on the rocks, then you know, <laughs> welcome them with uh, with some empathy. See see if uh, if we can tell their story back to them that that in a way that makes sense. Yeah, so sort, of, sort of what I've been doing is being a sort of agony out and doing a bit of therapy. Um, Petra's been doing that professionally, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we can carry on doing that. Um, I was thinking more in terms of preparation of, um, you know, the, I think the ARG in general is to have some kind of uh, extended mutual support network um, and secret society, because I think that's pretty much what you need to survive uh, things in the years ahead. So, yeah, we can we can just um, take it as it comes, or we can try and force it a bit. Um, but yeah, the pressure. I feel that the steam is we kind of lost our head of steam. I don't mind if they, if other people are are fine with it. That's fine with me. But if you know if everybody has some grand ambitions to save the world, or something, <laughs> we should we should do that. You know, I don't, I don't want it to uh, disappoint if people uh, have some, some kind of idea that they want to get something different out of this. I mean, is it okay? What, what are we doing and the, and the pace and everything like that? Uh, or does anybody want to change anything? I'm happy to, to see it grow as it grows organically like this, you know, just uh, we, we're not we're not putting too many 
controls and and directions to this and it's it's how it will emerge will be how it will emerge but um i i think it would be nice to to veer uh, a little bit also with the the wind that's to follow the wind that's coming and the wind that's coming as you said is a is a is a is a, a collapse um a slow collapse at the moment anyway and as ryan said the the narrative that we giving of this cry the way we're reading this crisis is is providing certainly support i've heard some people telling that this is a, a an, o, an oasis of sanity I, I got a message from someone who said that i mean so that is also that that provides a, a really good place for some people but uh, other than that I, I i still think that the arg is a fantastic idea for activists and i think that we must not let that go because it's. Uh, I, I'm really um, personally really attached to the idea of getting that off the ground one way or another. But, um, and I, I don't know in what capacity I can help in this, but I, I'm. I strongly feel that we should have that at the back of our mind all the time. Yeah. Okay. That's encouraging. So, yeah, I think we can carry on just building the egregore slowly, and you know, like-minded people what about um in terms of the, the oh go, go ahead on. well no i was gonna say the the website of the serious institute would that be um one way of um putting content out there that kind of prepares the ground for the arg um i mean we have a, you have a lot of content there already about the you know, the 10 or the 12 um, rules and the videos, but um, I don't know if, if there's a way to also um, shore that up, especially because, I mean, if, if you think that in the future this subreddit might might go away, then at least um, there would be more content on the website. Yeah. If anybody wants to put anything up, I mean, I I haven't put stuff up for a while, but if anybody wants to put some stuff up or or me put some stuff up, I I would like to write some more, and so I I had a little urge to I mean um, I have been writing you know about the layered brain and and stuff, and I you know I was putting those installments up on that somehow, but. I kind of stopped that, and the reason why I stopped that was I, I got to a sort of an awkward position where I I had to break uh, new ground, which I wasn't I wasn't ready to share with people. Um, but uh, yeah, so that but I would there are a couple of books that I would like to to write in that same kind of way, um, and I'm not sure if it's valuable. So one of them is the, um, you know, Darwin was wrong. I, w I would love to put that in a book, um, but also about you know, where we where civilization came from and where where it's probably going to end. Um, the other thing is um, artificial intelligence and geoengineering. I'd like to write books about those. But if if I if I start writing books and stuff, um, is it? Is anybody interested in that, or am I completely wasting my time? Wasting my time. Would, would you like me to do that? Like oh, yeah, 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 right, right. Yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, I think Ryan's got a yeah, Ryan's got a Ryan's got, Ryan's got two. Yeah. Ryan's got two. There's an echo. I think yeah, the two instances running. Uh, I think, I think Torsten and and Ryan have got um, an, uh, two instances each. Uh, two instances each. No, uh, no, I think we're just two people uh, named R. I uh, only have one instance. Oh, oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Oh, Reese, that's Reese. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw two. Hours. There's two. No, the the Torstein still has two, I think. Um, yeah. So okay. So 
I, I will devote some a little bit of attention to that if if you like. I, I the the thing about AI, I did get a um, I suddenly realized that you know there's a lot to say about AI, but particularly putting people off. <laughs> uh, and but I I got to the point where I didn't. I started thinking about it and formulating in my head, but I, I didn't get very far because I started to realize that to make the arguments about what uh, intelligence is and why AI isn't it, I s suddenly found that, you know, either people are smart enough to see it for themselves, <laughs> in which case they don't need the book, or otherwise the people that do actually need the book and are, you know, AI enthusiasts, um, they're kind of too stupid to to see it. You're probably never gonna they're never gonna be able to see it because they're just not smart enough. <laughs> Is um, so, yeah. I I yeah. The um the other thing is uh, I got an author friend who who actually probably everybody knows on this, but I've been sailing around with us. One of the reasons why I've been a bit and unproductive is because I've been having a good time sailing around and <laughs> uh, and hiking and meeting people and generally um, so he's an author and he kind of um, he told me a bit about authoring and I didn't realize you know I thought I was completely wasting my time putting up a book on Amazon and talking to him it's it's such a rough deal being an author that I suddenly realized it's not half bad. Just putting self-publishing on, on Amazon like I did before, I thought it was just a throwaway thing. But really, um, when uh, when I see that he gets like 10%, he has real publishers and stuff, he's a proper author, I'm not a real author, but he, um, he, he only gets 10% of, uh, of the sale price of, of the book. So it's, it's almost it's almost as not worth writing. In fact, he's a, he's a very well known, if not famous, author. And I suddenly realized I got about as much for my book just as self published on Amazon as he does out of all his really promoted and published stuff. So I suddenly thought, oh well, if that's what being an author is, it's I, I don't feel at all bad about putting books up. Uh, to Amazon, so I might I might do that if people want to see it. But I'll I'll if I do I'll, I'll publish them as in, in parts, you know, in on Amazon, so then people can tell me what they think. But yeah, I'll go back to the the layered brain one if if every, everybody wants to see that. And the whole point of this is, um, I think it can save time later if people suddenly you know become doomers. Um, they kind of need a track right to go to go on um and so i um yeah i i kind of think of it as you know laying out all these things but i'd like it if other people would also do do stuff you know propose stuff for other people and either even if it's other people's work or original do you know what i was thinking the other day too i was thinking of all those meetings we've had and i've listened i, I re-listen to them sometimes not i i re-listen to your videos the first ones up to the darwin ones that you did on your own but i i also listen to the interviews and to our group again and i'm thinking these meetings and our conversations I've, I've got an enormous amount of material too that if it was somehow um written or i don't know how to i i don't know how to formulate exactly what i think but it's, it's got an enormous content, uh, mostly by you, uh, because you are the one that talks mostly in these meetings. And a lot of things that you talk about, you have written about um, in, in the few things that you have let us share. But still, there's an awful lot of things that came out. There's an awful lot of material there that's um, that's valuable. And, and I, I think sometimes, I don't know if anybody in the group understands what I mean, but I think that should be... Um, should be you should be able to read it too do you know not just uh i not just watch yeah. it back on that would be really, really nice if a transcript you mean 
maybe even tags, yeah. tags of dialogue. Yeah, transcript that would be edited, of course, because there could be some things that you know Hugh would like to 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 edit, but but I think it, a transcript would would start after now we've got uh, we had meeting seventy eight, I think, aren't we, Mike? And I think that's uh, that's a, there's a lot of material, and that's I'm not talking about the other videos too uh, before that are, of course, uh, are my favorite. Um, but uh, yeah, and the Darwin ones I I think are, are just are worthy of a book. It's worthy of a of a, of a real you know uh, written um, manuscript. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that's a really good idea uh, about mining some of these conversations. I think rather than just do a transcript, which um, uh, which would get us so far, but um, I, I think it would be interesting to maybe hire someone to go through um, these and make a book out of some of the conversation points, see if there's any kind of structure there that we could hang things on. Um, or um, find um, you know there are, there are ghostwriters that you know they can take content and and kind of uh, put things together. I think Gary would be uh, interested in in hearing this. Um, I think he, when he comes back, um, I, it would be nice to to talk to him about this, and he might listen to this meeting anyway. So, hey, Gary. <laughs> Yeah, it would be really nice if somebody likes writing enough to summarize some of these things. And, you know, it would be a good exercise to just reflect on them and then come up with new questions so that we could, uh, you know, develop it into a kind of a dialogue. Because I'm pretty sure if you go through and write some of it up, I mean, a pricey, not, not a transcript that's too heavy going. Um, and then even even employing somebody to do it, I think, is too heavy going. But if somebody wants to go back and just um, try and find some more interesting ones and then try and summarize them and then generate more questions, that could be quite a nice format. Well, what I was thinking is that we, we're just a little group, but sizable enough. Um, we all have interest in the meetings. Um, we could why don't we try to do it as a collective thing together instead of getting somebody from the outside who's not tuned into all the videos that you've done before that we have we're using terms and stuff that we know so if we if we divided a little bit a sample like you know you take one or two meetings each and and we each of us do a little I, uh, our own thing whatever it is we're not i mean i'm not a writer and i don't i don't know if anybody here is but we could just try it, try it to see what happens, and and have a little thing for this winter going that way, and and then see if it works or if it's not if it's not good, where well, we can re reconsider other other options. Yeah, yeah that would could, be excellent, we, especially if we did it like a candlelight thing. Say that again, please, Lord Hugh. Yeah. I think that'd be excellent, especially if we did it like a candlelight thing. You know, we could uh, maybe do a transcript, uh, not quite a transcript, but uh, to write up some kind of script that we could use as, say, a podcast, or you know, people could read it as a po podcast if we could assimilate some of the ideas and yeah, you know, show the, the right yeah. edges of yeah. the ideas. Yeah. And the format of a dialogue is really good um, because the person that's sometimes there's some questions that you answer and then you you go on and elaborate on the on the question sometimes there's been a few exchange but we should introduce a, a, a dialogue between Hugh and the extinctionati and and do this as a kind of a, a thing that's going through the meetings because we're constantly exploring um our together things so it should be just the extinctionati you know and the dialogues, <laughs> the, the like Plato, you know. In the early days, Mike would uh, take our, some of us would take notes and then we would publish them along with, uh, you know, the video, but we got so many meetings now. But I think it is a great idea, especially if we just posted like a list of, you know, one through 75 and then somebody can just volunteer. Okay, I'm going to take number 75 because I'm interested in that. And instead of... Um, 
dividing it randomly that somebody will get one through five. Uh, someone can just say, I'm taking, I'm checking out number three because I was interested in that. Yeah, that's how the power of myth got. Yeah, that would be great. Say that again. I said that's how the power of myth got published. Joseph Campbell. It was a, an interview that they turned into a book. Yeah, it would be better to have it not quite so much as a verbatim kind of rendering of, of the actual conversation. But what would be really nice, I think, is to tease out some of the topics. So we, if we find, you know, some of the topics we've repeated, they've been, you know, come up again and again. So if we could kind of tease them out, uh, that would be really good. And then we could also, if, if we had some text um, that was kind of a uh, bonus material on the videos, we could actually point to it from the videos. So if we, if we keep track, if you do this, then keep track of the video that you, you know, the text relates to. And so we can refer back to it from the videos. I, that, that would be excellent. I think that would be really good if anybody wants to do it. Yeah, but I don't uh, don't be scared about the quality or anything. Just get stuck in and do it if you're interested. I, I started I started to listen to, to you know more often now to old meetings because and and <clears throat> I realized that some of them on the mega thread had a topic and we usually stayed on it. So after that, we stopped writing the topic. So that would be first, you know. To see, and sometimes the topics just emerged from from the the events that were happening, or our mood, or however you felt, and you know what was happening. So I think yes, it would it would kind of organize things a little bit. We we could have a we could have a kind of thing to look back on. So oh yes, we because those conversations are so rich, you know, and you also give a lot of references of books, and movies, and works, and articles, and everything. And all that is is kind of lost if you have to listen to it again. So it would be nice to have that also um, on on a on a written on a print, you know, somewhere or on a PDF or something that we could look back because it it's dense. It's become very very big. Yeah, you know what it would be nice is if we had some kind of introduction to the extinction Hardy or something. Or, or some like Lieber extinction artist <laughs> compendium um, for people that come on later. What I'm kind of thinking is that, you know, people come to doomerism and they kind of arrive, they start asking the same things, they kind of follow the same path. So people start asking me, how long have we got left? <laughs> and I kind of give the standard answer. I've like, I've answered many times how many times we got left, normally dodging it. How much time we have left is not a good way of looking at things. And then I talk about Kairos and Kronos and, you know, I've done it many times. It would be nice to to have something people that kind of land, um, like Petra did. She, she kind of landed on and then gradually figured out where we were at. Um, it could all be done in a in a book if somebody wants to do it. Once to start writing some text would be great. I had a um, kind of crazy idea just now. What if it was a children's book? It's like like Greta's age, young or younger. You mean Greta's children? She's she's eighteen now. <laughs> it would be good. I mean, they coming on in spades. Yeah. I mean, that's really who it's for. I mean, isn't it? I mean, if you're just new to doomerism, I think it's the, it's the kids that I feel most bad about. Yeah, yeah I, I hear they're, they're really um, like the most uh, disaffected uh, folks percentage wise about the future. Yeah, I, I saw this week that it said 57% of kids 
are doomers now. They they think they have no future. They think that we're all stuffed. <laughs> don't know don't know what the rest of them are thinking. The forty three percent they they must be completely out to lunch, but but there, there are definite things to to tell kids. I mean, I've, I've been telling my kids for for a while now that you know the, I tell them you know they get depressed and stuff. And that's, what uh, most people do is they say, "Oh no, we must have hope and stuff." And I, I say, "Look, you got to be happy now because it's just going to get worse." I said, "The shit's going to fly." I said in twenty twenty, you know, I said like, "Oh, they're not having a good time." I said like, "Well." You got to learn to have a good time at a time like this because it just gets worse from here. And you think, well, you know, any psychologist will tell you that's incredibly bad advice. How can you do that? And I tell you, it's the right thing to say because if you tell people this is a great time, it gets worse from here. What my kids have been doing is they've been listening to me, and then they've been forcing the moment. They've been going and doing adventurous things, and uh, you know. My son goes completely out of his comfort zone now, and he keeps on coming back and saying, I, I'm having a fabulous time. <laughs> he's really living. But it's only because I'm telling him he's got no future that he's starting to really enjoy the present. So it's kind of reverse psychology, but it's, you know, psychologists don't do that. And I think we should. We should, you see, they all try and bullshit the kids, tell them we we have time, we have hope, and the solutions, and they say no. Say we, you, you know, it's far better to tell kids you are absolutely screwed. You better start living for the moment, and you better live your best life starting now, because next year is going to be much shittier than this year, and the year after is going to be much shittier than that. So you know, but it ain't that bad now. You see, that's that's the thing about the, these kids being doomers is they're being doomers way ahead of time. They're not even suffering much. I mean, all we've had is a little pandemic. But they, you know, they're not really suffering, you know, genuine hardship. I mean, a bit of lockdown, and, you know, <laughs> this and that. But it's it's not the real shit. Uh, it's like 1% of the real shit that's coming. Um, so there is plenty to enjoy now. There's plenty you, you can find happiness, exhilaration, just the idea of theater, there's just the joy and adventure of life. Uh, you, you can s start getting people into that. And so... Um, but what, what you could yeah. tap into also is, is the joy and, and adventure of stepping outside this stupid system plan that has planned for the young people, this, this life of slave, this future of career and retirement and this. And, I think if ever we have to to reach out to youth to the youth, it's it's showing them that. Listen, guy, there's another thing that can be written now for you. You know, it doesn't. And what is doom really is what we were preparing for, what you thought was reality. That was real doom. What we have now is another quality of doom that's that's based on reality, but also on exciting stuff. And you know, just. Just dig into yeah, the yeah, example out of upside down. In Lebanon at the moment, I mean, in Lebanon, there's collapse full full time. Like it's just continuous. The Middle East, lots of we we're saying that the young are not getting it hard. They are, and in a lot of countries, they are. And those people have a lot to tell us about what's going on at the moment. Yeah, people are suffering psychological angst, but they're not really suffering any physical deprivation yet <laughs> and so yeah i think that there's huge scope for them to enjoy what they've got today um because there, there is some and the damn thing is that getting them out of upside down world you know those keep on saying the alien cortex does the substitution and inversion and everything's inverted everybody you look at the news they report stuff as bad news that's actually good news people should actually see it you know it's like oh the system's collapsing. It's like, that's fucking good news. <laughs> it was like, uh oh, we won't be able to have a career in retirement and stuff. It said, like, that's overrated. You've just been freed from that curse that, you know, the few, you know, generations used to have. But they used to have to go to college and then be condemned to a cubicle and then try and, you know, get a, a pension 
so that they could spend their golden years, which was only about five, uh, just doing something nice. You say, you're freed from all that shit. Now, when people tell you, oh, you've got to go to college, otherwise you'll never get a good job, you can tell them, there are no such thing as a good job. The whole planet's going in flames. The whole civilization's coming down. We don't give a shit about a good job or a pension or retirement. And uh, and then, you know, suddenly that's very liberating. It's uh, it's good news. Yeah, it's, it's funny that the, the Bible was is really a, apocalyptic. Right? It's, um, it is a doom, a doom occult. But... The gospel actually means good news. Gospel actually means good news. <laughs> and so, yeah, saying, oh, yeah, here's the good news. We're all screwed. But it is it is true. Yeah. I would, I would like to be able to communicate that, especially to, to, you know, young kids and people that are just coming to Doomerism and just say, this is, this is the landscape. Every time there's a thing that says, oh, you know, there's an energy crunch and an energy crisis. No one can drive around and say, yeah, we call that great news. <laughs> Everybody else starts slitting their wrists. We thought <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Okay, so I hope, I hope people do that. Take it seriously. Um, there's a, yeah, there's so much work and opportunity. There's so, so many things to be done. Like, for example, um, you know, just in terms of therapy and just giving people therapy, uh, therapy kind of needs to be reinvented for, for doomerism, I think. And so, you know, traditional lines of therapy and stuff, they don't cut it. I mean, all of them kind of, without realizing it, had some kind of progressive narrative. So it was kind of you get people back on their feet, you know, so that they can actually progress. And that doesn't work anymore when you say, well, you haven't got a future. We're probably all going extinct. <laughs> Be happy. <laughs> it's like that uh, kind of, that's, that was traditionally taught in religions and stuff, but it got lost in this progressive humanist narrative that things always get better tomorrow. Say, so, well, nobody believes that story anymore. So we have to reinvent the psychotherapy for people. I think another aspect there that that doesn't work anymore, or or there's at least a, a remnant of it in our, our culture is the um, this humanist, um, everyone is a special and amazing person. And, um, you know, it, it puts a lot of burden on our shoulders that, that we, we're supposed to, you know, save the world ourselves and it's on our shoulders and this kind of things. Um, and you know, one thing that, that helped me through the last week a little bit was I just kind of broke down and realized that I don't really matter that much. Like, in the grand scope of things. And um, that, you know, as much as I, I care about things, there's that the, things move so quickly that I can't change them all. Um, and uh, to, to just kind of let go of that, um, that burden um, and of, of my ego and wanting to be the, you know, to, to fix the world, um, and be a champion for it. Um, sometimes that that um, that can be kind of heavy. And I'm still kind of wrestling with it to figure out, you know, how I'm feeling about it long term. But uh, it helped for a little while, at least, <laughs> to stop thinking that I mattered so much. Yeah, I had a conversation about free will and whether we actually do have free will, and. To me, the answer is it's kind of a non-question. It's it's a question founded on bad premises, and it's part of the the problem with it is it it assumes this that you know who this you is that has free will, and 
that was so part and parcel of humanism and the enlightenment that was this concept of the individual and i think it's on a very very shaky ground because it, it really helps to actually ask yourself those kind of questions and say you know do we have free will and then say well who would it be and when you get down to it you can see like they actually put some figures on it and stuff so for example you know how many how, the rate that you can think the rate the amount of sense coming into your brain is it's about it's about a hundred meg or something you know it's a uh, it's, a, it's about an internet connections worth of sense perception the stuff that you're saying going out is like 60 words a minute speaking way less than that writing and you know you often we get so caught up into this idea of personalities and this thing of individuality that we forget that it's uh, just just an atom really so I mean for example like you know, people say like oh Hitler did this and Hitler invaded Europe and stuff and it's like just think about it in a year you've only got 365 days you could you know, even if you worked 14 hour days how many words can you actually speak how many words do you think Hitler actually spoke in a day it's probably not that many you know, if you actually put it if you had you know if you actually did it like a court case and had uh, a stenographer and that was actually writing word for word what he actually said you would come out with very little I mean you would come out with with, with maybe a binder full in in a year and you think you know well Hitler invaded Russia is like it, it can't be Hitler invaded Russia because it's only a binder full of him information that's coming you know these communicating to the world and about an internet's connection coming in and I mean that in terms of audiovisual content and that your senses pick up so with such a tiny narrow tube when you think of what went into the invasion of Russia and the millions of people and each one of them had their own story and their own dialogues and their own thing they said and so it's a, almost absurd to say that Hitler had anything to do with it at all but there's this the what what really is is it becomes a focus that everybody agrees that there is a focus but it is the idea of Hitler the individual that everybody's responding to as they invade Russia and they do Operation Barbarossa but it's done on a phenomenally huge case just imagine all the panzer tanks and every rivet was put in there by somebody giving their attention to it every drop of oil was got from somebody in this long chain but it's it's a, that you know ants an ant colony doesn't even begin to give it justice it's just a field of atoms and every atom just believes that there is a Hitler atom that's directing this whole maelstrom and that's why it actually works but that actual Hitler atom is pretty much a fiction and it really I think is helpful if you, we think of us in those ways so you know you can become a phenomena like Jordan Peterson did and now his life is completely fucked up <laughs> and he says you know he's basically a basket case now because he's he's famous but it's I think what what uh, really puts people in hospital and stuff is that they're not really prepared for this roller coaster of you know when the the difference between the reality of what an individual is which is almost nothing and then what uh, famous people get made into by the this huge universal mind so you know that so Jordan Peterson became an icon of reference that everybody you know the society used for its destination but he's he's not directing where it goes it's just it, they just integrate creating the little drip feed of information that comes out of him uh, and, and so he has a preferential input and influence into this egregore of of a Jordan Peterson character um, so he has more influence than most people on this idea of Jordan Peterson but he he's not really <laughs> the Jordan Peterson so you know, is is the famous guy and is is the the nexus point of all this kind of behavior all this dynamic behavior is swirling around this one nexus and it's not the actual physical guy <clears throat> who lives somewhere in Canada it's the idea 
of that guy that everybody is revolving around. So it, it really helps, I think, to actually think of yourself in that way and get out of this abominable, abominable idea of um, this atomic importance or almost, almost godhead of an individual um, because it just doesn't work this idea humanist idea that human humans are so damned important and we all you know every one of us matters it was it was perfectly summed up in in that uh, in you know the disney movie the incredibles when when the guy says you know the, the mom says to him you know oh we're all special and then the kid dash there says, so um, you know, so that's just a way, another way of saying if everyone's special, then no one's special. And that's the problem with humanism. It's told everybody that we're all special. And it's like you can't have eight billion supremely special children of the universe. It gets very quickly to be like the third man. You know, the third man movie, the great thing in the Prada, the great scene where Harry Lyme <laughs> is asking, how can you be such a bastard? Um, well, um, well, he's asking Harry Lyme, the, the protagonist is asking Harry, Harry Lyme, how can you be such a bastard in essence? And Orson Welles' character there, Harry Lyme, he says, he says just look down there in the Prada, they're in, this, in the wheel, in the Ferris wheel in the Prada. He says, just look down on all those little people. They're just basically, you can barely see them. They're just ants. They're just almost atoms. And he said, like, you know, if I gave you 20,000 for one of those little dots to disappear, he said, well, I might keep you awake a little bit, the first one. But by the second or third one, you wouldn't give a rat's ass anymore. <laughs> and it's really, really healthy to swing between those ideas so that, you ask yourself, you know, if we have free will, is like really these little atoms have free will down in the process. <laughs> and then you swing back again to say, like you Harry Ryan, you could take one of them out. <laughs> so, you, so you, there's this strange thing where you do have power and you have zero power as well. But the more you, the more you reflect on those kind of things, the more it dissolves the idea of the individual. And it, it dissolves that false idea of the individual that the humanists came up with. And eventually, that humanist idea has become extremely destructive. And you can see it just in the, the fact, like, if you go back to what Shell Corporation did. So the Shell Corporation delayed climate change and possibly caused extinction by a brilliant PR campaign where they said, how do we stop systemic change? We, we just tell everybody it's all about the individual and individual change. And collectively, all our individual changes add up, which sounds logical, but it's absolute horseshit. <laughs> it's like, do all the collective little things that everybody does in Auschwitz, you know, translate to freedom? No. If you're a prisoner in Auschwitz, the system will keep you a prisoner in Auschwitz. It's nothing to do with you. You can collect bottle tops or use plastic straws or recycle in Auschwitz. It's never going to make you free. It's never going to make Auschwitz anything other than Auschwitz. And that's what the company did. They went off of them. I can't remember who it was, but it was probably the same guys as Philip Morris that did the same thing with smoking. And they said, he said, we can stop systemic change if we just tell everybody it's the individual responsibility. And the guys went and made this brilliant, brilliant move. They invented the term carbon footprint. They basically got it from, because everybody has been to, you know, out into the wilderness and has been to some kind of park, and they say, you know, leave only footprints and take only pictures. So they knew that meme was in everybody's head in environmentalism. So they used it. They said, okay, okay, what we need is, like the footprint that you're not allowed to leave in the game reserve or the national park, said, everybody knows about that. We did a number on the kids there so we've got that little little hook that we can hang this on so now brilliant brilliant thing you'd say your carbon footprint so therefore you know you have to pick up your trash and then it's like we're off the hook so and that's what they did the next thing they knew was reuse recycle reduce now, all of those were um and and they openly did them if you go back look at all those things where they it you know 
they were actually sponsored and they weren't hidden. They actually, Shell would put their logo on that shit. And then most people would say, oh, isn't that nice? All the oil companies are changing and, you know, starting to be green. It was like, horseshit. They knew damn well. You, the documents are all there. You can go and read. They were just heading people off for systemic change. And now people have kind of caught up with them. But they don't know where to go because the whole schooling and everything was, was you know, since the Enlightenment, home and all of those guys you know, was saying um, you know, that we're all these individuals. And uh, yeah, it was a 17th century thing. But, um, yeah, it was that uh, that idea of the individual and the sovereign individual and be, and they, you know basically said god doesn't exist then kind of made humans into homo deus as you know Yuval harari says but the, the it said that if there's no god then what's the next best thing well it's this human imaginary idea of the human individual but then you descend into all these things like, well, then what's important? Well, maximizing the feelings of this person, good feelings, and you know, all these ridiculous things that don't matter a, a shit <laughs> suddenly become super important. You know, how somebody feels, their opinion, their, their voting choices, their consumer choices, these become very, very weighty and important. And it's like, how can they be weighty and important? Because you just said, that collectively, eight billion, 8 billion of them translates to change. Except that 8 billion of them is exactly the same thing. They all like non-conformists, just like everybody else. So it's saying like, if you're such a, you see the paradox? If, you say, if you're such a conformist that everybody collectively being responsible to the same ideal yields an outcome, well, then you're a fucking prisoner to this fucking ideal. So anybody, you, we see it with, with the vac, va, the vax now as well, is that you know they, it's a collective responsibility thing. So if you if you're not playing ball, then it's like you know, a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. I've got a lot of pressure in the last few weeks because um, you know people have this idea that it's your individual responsibility. We all do this together, and then it works out. And so like, ah, of course it doesn't, man. It just doesn't work that way. <laughs> So anyway, I just that's that was my response. Is, is that is you really want to noodle around with that idea of individuality and just particularly remember that it's like, you know, we're born, we do it a few years, we have a little think and then we die. We have our little thinks, we have our little feelings, and then we die. But it's like if you become the most famous person in the world and you write, you know the complete works of Shakespeare or better. It's like, doesn't mount a pile of beans. Eventually they, you know, people can't even read Shakespeare today. You, you, can, you can write the most brilliant thing known to man and it has its time. Nowadays people are learning Shakespeare. All they learn about Shakespeare in, in American schools these days is, is that Shakespeare was a anti-Semite misogynist racist. Really? That's where Shakespeare is today. Well, that's the end of Shakespeare. So even if you're bloody Shakespeare, you can't, you know, you can, you can have a 500 year run with people of influence. But, you know, 500 years on this planet, what does it amount to? Yeah, I, I think the, the challenge around individuality is not just internal. I mean, uh, it's, it's, if you look at yourself enough, you'll see that you are individual. There's plenty of um, divisions in you that don't cohere. But uh, to the outside world, when you're put into a spreadsheet or a database, your identity is used against you, and that's individual. So the simplification of us all um, as entries in a in a um, you know to, to be made legible. Um, in the uh, um, way, it, it it it's often simplified down into one number or one um, uh, something that you can't escape from, right? Um. Yeah, I mean that's the paradox of dystopias, is that 
unless you actually have a number, like an identity number, like all these states want to put an identity number on you, like like in Auschwitz or South Africa, you have a passport with an identity number. And if you're in the military, you have to. So it's like, unless you have an identity number, then you don't exist. But if you have an identity number, then you also don't exist because then you're just a number. <laughs> so it's a. Uh, he yeah, said, like, in, in what sense does the individual exist? And it's like, well, it's a temporary assemblage. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think the, the, the problem there is that um, to be treated as a number is, uh, you know, in one sense, it's gotten a lot worse because of technique and technology, um, because the w this is where I think the real threat from AI is, is that, it, there's a lot of data that are being collected that um, even if they are not being leveraged correctly or effectively now, you know, the, that data is just sitting there waiting to be used um, to, you know, make us more than a number to the system to identify er areas of who we are that may not be fully tracked yet, but will be in the future and uh, or maybe they already are. And those those are things that have real impact on our ability to have autonomy in in our lives. And um, I think the there's a video by the the hated one that recently came out. I think it sh shows that even outside of China, where there's the you know the um, uh, what's it called the citizen score thing. Um, there's uh, there are like seven different Social credit, credit score? Social credit score. Social credit score. Yeah, there are seven of those in the US and the in the Western markets. They're not unified into one, but there's a there's a health score and there's a consumer score and there's like a bunch of those that, that are used to determine our lives. And um, the the you know I there's also like we, we're still living in somewhat of a paper identification world um but there's technologies come out like um the cardano cryptocurrency just partnered with one of the um the biggest um know your customer uh, anti-money laundering agency there is um to replace a lot of those things so if you wanted to engage in a smart contract you know uh, crypto economics things um you know it doesn't matter if you get a second passport somewhere like you still can't use those services unless you're, you know, digitally signed by, by the state in a way. Um. Yeah, the see, the thing uh, with autonomy and freedom is that, um, and this is the reason why you need to have um, a secret society inside of dystopia is freedom doesn't really come you see this is related to the liberal idea of individuality freedom doesn't come from having the citizen the sovereign citizen so in other words it no one has freedom within this kind of clockwork orange so nobody has freedom within the democratic society and you know if you have a social security number and you're a taxpayer in the industrial system nobody has um, has any freedom within that uh, so it's a it's a delusion to say you know oh, the land of the free or we're losing democracy and freedom goes with all the kind of uh, michael moore kind of crap <laughs> it's a, is you you never had any freedom uh if you're actually living in one of those but now here's the thing you never have that freedom at that tier and it's very limited tier. So for most of these people, they, their whole life is this uh, really liberal democracy and all the systems and institutions um, of, of that liberal democracy. And they think that's life. And you hear a lot of people saying, if you're anti-serve, they, they say, oh, you're anti-everything. They say, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm anti a tiny slice of what the world is. And they, but that tiny slice is the whole world. So the, what I'm proposing is that 
freedom is never inside that system. So in other words, again, my go-to reference, so the concentration camp, is people, people say, you're restricting our freedom within the camp. You say you're deluded if you're a prison inmate and you think you have a, any kind of freedom whatsoever. Say, so where do you have your freedom? Well, you have it in a meta layer. So there's the camp system or the Auschwitz or the liberal democracy or industrial system. It only has intelligence at a certain layer. And you don't, where it has intelligence, so in other words, where Kronos rules, you don't have any uh, autonomy and you don't really have any freedom. And so where your freedom is, is in the meta layer. Because humans are always more intelligent than the Vogons and machines and the Kronos and the computers and the AI. AI is super dumb and always will be. Uh, but people don't understand what it is. So then they think, you know, like Elon Musk, oh, one day we'll be pets of AI. It's like, no, if you, you're more likely to be a pet of your, po your toaster or your washing machine. It's, it's the same kind of mechanism and it has its limits. Human intelligence can go beyond that to a meta layer of intelligence. So in other words, it's like having another conversation on top of this mechanistic uh, conversation. So it's implied in the give unto Caesar what is Caesar and give unto God what is God. It's saying like, you know, Rome is always going to be Rome. You can function in Rome and you, your autonomy is outside of that. And it's a, it's a, secret society it's a hidden conversation it's a different way of thinking outside so you can be free and be part of a new egregore and a, a new meta layer um of of intelligence within this unintelligent uh really prison layer and so you have to start stop thinking in terms of you know the restrictions of ai and the limits of you know the guys are doing like bitcoin and that is is completely fuck it's because they're trying to in the middle of the pr prison yard they're trying to escape so they they're trying to escape in plain sight using the same systems of incarceration so it's kind of like saying i'm going to build my freedom in the middle of this prison yard and building a little wall and saying um we're free inside, inside this little little courtyard within the prison yard it's like you're deluded the way, the way to be free in uh, the prison courtyard is if you have a meta intelligence that's more intelligent than the system, more intelligent than the people that are running the system, and you have a group of people that are actually thinking in terms of that, in terms of that layer. So, in other words, it's kind of like people talking over your head. If, and if this isn't making any sense to, to you, then let me tell you this story. When I came to London, I, I have to said this before but i'll say it again when i came to london i was a hick from south africa and so people were very very sophisticated in london so i was kind of sport for them because they could all talk over my head and they could get me spun up and they, they could you know basically back me around like a ball in in conversation is what, is what i mean same so conversation in a pub <clears throat> they would be playing a game that they all knew. They all knew what everybody else was doing. They were like, like winding up the colonial. They were like saying, getting, getting me all spun up and stuff. And then gradually, I got to realize what they were doing. They were talking over my head and having huge, huge sport because they were just playing with me. But then, as soon as I realized what they were doing, then I started to get, and the game kind of ended because then I was on the new level, and then I could talk on the same sophisticated level. And so, so it's kind of like that. You can talk to with within the prison system using the language of the prison system, but the, you can also be so free that you can be in control of the prison yard, and even the prison warden doesn't know that he's actually subservient to you. So, it's it is a kind of a trope and uh, yeah and stuff and. Uh, but uh, you know, in, you get it in fiction, and Terry Pratchett and stuff has did, did some, some some things. Basically, the 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 prisoner is actually is <laughs> is actually the emperor, and uh, the best the best defense for an emperor is for for the whole world to think that you don't know.
you know, you're in the dungeon and the, the best, the most secure place for the king is pretending to be the prisoner in the dungeon in the castle. But if you have such a, such a fantastic control over your domain, um, then you can afford to spend all your time in the dungeon and uh, very secure there when everybody, nobody knows that you're the boss. So to be the boss of these systems um, is not about defeating them head on in like Bitcoin going, you know, having a better algorithm. It's uh, to having um, a meta algorithm. I hope that helps. Does that does that help at all? Yeah, that does. I think the um, the you 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 have to disbelieve the game as as set up and start to play a different game with it. I'm not sure which exactly. one yet. Exactly, it is <laughs> game is a good way. Ah, no, that's the thing. Uh, well, you see, the way that Kronos works is it has to know in advance. It's predictive. You see, one of the one of the reasons AI will never s supersede human intelligence, except in a very narrow definition, you know, of of human intelligence. It's very singular. It, it won't ever uh, get to hum general human intelligence because the, the physical limits of what you can do with a clock. <laughs> but that that aside, the uh, in, in general, a good way of thinking of it is like a game. And there's always a meta game. Um, and so, you know, often dictators are <clears throat> given the runaround by artists and people that, <clears throat> you know, parody them and mock them because they, they, they're playing a different game than, with, with the public and the public's attention. They play playing a different game that the dictator was normally kind of a vogue on can't, can't aspire to. Um, and so it, uh, the AI and dictators and vogons and that mindset, um, that linear mindset <coughs> is predictive. So it has to be, most of the stuff has to be done in advance by, by the nature of what it is. It, ha it has to be formalized um, and then executed, you know, switched on and then executed. The the meta game and the other games in, in higher layers, meta, meta, meta game, is um cannot be predicted. So so the, the thing that you just said there is you don't know <laughs> how is it you cannot know. If you could know, it would be Kronos's game. It would be predicted. So the that's a strange thing about intelligence is intelligence manifests itself in the moment. So it's, it's spontaneous and brilliant in the moment. <laughs> but by definition, you can't predict it. If you could predict it, it wouldn't be very smart. So it's the, you know, the epitome of wit and stuff like that. You say, well, I know that we have to be wittier, but I'm not sure <laughs> uh, what that wit is going to be. Well, you can't pre-can wit. <laughs> That's, you yeah. So, there's, but, there's a bit of wit right right from Hugh's mouth, is you can't pre-can wit. <laughs> yeah. Oscar Wilde cannot be done in advance. Sure, but I, I think the the threat of that I see is actually from the the lack of wit or or creativity uh, at the first layer. So I'll give an example. So um, given the you know folks wanting to have predictive pol policing and that kind of thing, where they, they want to have, um, uh, say, uh, let's say you got some uh, a predictor that was 99% accurate that um, uh, someone would be, you know, committing a, a, a violent act. Um, and you have, you know, say 300 million Americans and um, the, that means that uh, if there are actually, you know, only a, a few thousand people that would actually be doing these violent acts, you, you'd have, uh, um, you know, one percent of three hundred um, million people who might be in, wrongfully imprisoned, right? In, um, in the so, so like three hundred thousand people um, uh, being imprisoned who. Um, 
I'm oh, sorry, uh, who would fall outside that range. Now, I don't know if I said those numbers correctly, but um, the, the point is that uh, it would be almost entirely wrongful imprisonment. But because that, that statistical nuance is something that Vogons might not understand, and they might say, okay, this, this you know, trial system, it's very expensive, it takes a lot of these things, but if we just hand it over to a computer, it'll be a lot easier, um, a lot cheaper, you know, and, and we end up with you know massive uh, uh, you know false positives because people didn't didn't understand that nuance at that layer one like Vogon level, um, and it's if you lose at game one, it's kind of like it, it, it Inception or something. If you die in the dream, you die in real life, right? Like if you lose at layer one, uh, and you're you you. you you don't get much chance to play uh, at the, that level two. Yes. Yes, that's why you have to give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, because you, you, can't, um, you, you can't snuff yourself out at Caesar's level. So that's why I keep on saying to people is don't make these, these dramatic stands. Don't, don't be a martyr. Because if you, if you go up head, head uh, if you you know, go head to head with the system, you know, it's all very dramatic and principled and stuff, but you also never get to get onto the meta layer uh, because you, you know, snuffed out at that layer. Uh, so this is the, the supreme danger. You know, I mean, it wouldn't be much of a game if this wasn't the danger, but this is the exi existential threat is they will snuff us out. And the particular thing is geoengineering and uh, geoengineering, just like predictive policing, you can't do measurements that way because it's a complex system and you can't take simple measurements. So you're taking one dimensional measurements of a complex machine as you're going to get into so much trouble. But in, in doing the, that, these fools will like destroy all the, the biosphere. So, so we have to, you know, not martyr ourselves, but we have to get to the stage where we get around these Vogons trying to do things like geoengineering. But if they go too far down the road with geoengineering, yeah, we baked. I think I think we are actually baked. I think we've we we, we struck out <laughs> on layer one already. So we we just going through the motions. But you, you should do that anyway, even because you do, it's uh, you not entirely predictive because it is a complex. You might get a black swan later on. So I I think you can. You can be sure on kind of a 80-20 rule that <laughs> somewhere along the line we will get a massive black swan we weren't expecting. So you should carry on as um, as if the show's not over, but I think they probably have already cooked our goose. Uh, just with geoengineering and that kind of linear thinking. But the thing is to to get the conversation going on the meta layer. So um, the, that uh, you know, it's, if you look at say the intellectual dark web and those guys, is is they they still inside the prison yard uh, with prison yard thinking, and uh, they're not on the level of people that are stepping outside of the the system creating a meta layer, and the people that there's also a danger on the next layer and the danger on the meta layer is that people go off into some fantasy so that's um the danger is machio that they become religious or say you know it's not about the world it's about, it's about god and then those guys are subject to kool-aid generally the kool-aid in the jungle that's that's the you see look at jim jones as an example is he saw the Vogon layer quite clearly, and he said, you know, could, he could clearly see that you have to step out of this. He got an egregore, and he had a cult of people that had a new way of thinking, that had, you know, age of Aquarius and stepping into um, uh, something new. Um, but it, uh, he, he, he was at his limit. He didn't know how to navigate that area, so he did two great sins. One. He didn't give unto Caesar what is Caesar, so he, he violated the rules of the first level. 
the Vogon level. And then number two, he went off into this thing saying, you know, it's just another plane. We'll, you know, it's just transitioning to a new existence. And well, it's not, it's dying in the jungle and no eternal life on another plane. It's just <laughs> horror in the jungle. And so, yeah, but you're not out of the woods just because you're on the next layer, but I'm just saying, don't get bogged down fighting Caesar. The best way to fight Caesar is to just give Caesar's due and then start on the, the meta layer. And yeah, I mean, you can clearly see it. In, yeah, you can, you can yeah. clearly see it. I mean, there's a, uh, just in terms of cyber, think of it in terms of a war. Um, you can see a conventional war, military tactics, the kind of uh, military intelligence that's all about spy satellites and um, surveillance and and scouts uh, scouting and that kind of thing and that's conventional military thing and you, you've got to fight that war you can't just say well we'll ignore that <laughs> it's like no those guys are going to get you if you just ignore that you have to you have to at least meet them or beat them at that level and then you start a new war which is you know the psyops war and a psychological war and then that in terms of warfare is is the next layer up um, but yeah, the the next layer up uh, has an infinite kind of regress, and whether you can navigate that or not um, is the test of intelligence. That's where real intelligence comes in. But see, in the war, when these guys, you know, they they could never get to a full-on confrontational conventional war because it was too dangerous in terms of nuclear war. So they. They had a lot of proxy wars, and then they had this massive game of espionage. And so the Cold War was largely fought psychologically. But the guys at the front lines of that psychological warfare, <laughs> they would frequently go nuts. <laughs> because it's very hard to live in a James Bond world and be a spy without completely losing your marbles, because it's just so fucking surreal. So, yeah, I, I would sketch out a rough... Um, a rough uh, kind of thumbnail sketch of what intelligence is, and it's basically being able to survive and thrive in the surreal. There's a quote for you. <laughs> but uh, but look at it. Most people don't even like the surreal. But, you know, I think that the reason why we didn't get anywhere with Jeff and, and those guys, uh, well, well, Spencer, I think Spencer, I think we might have done better if we got through to Jeff, but Spencer blocked us. And I think the reason why he blocked us is he's out of, he, he was out of his comfort level with the surreal. So I think in doing all of that stuff in Bright Axiom and stuff like that, um, those guys were dealing with very surreal shit. And I think he bottled out. So it's that cop again. I think the, the cop inside him, um, you know, pulled the, pulled the brakes on it. And so then he came back saying, you know, I, I want a consensus reality. <laughs> that, that, in other words, is Kronos. He's saying a consensus reality, what he's saying is I want something solid, predictable, boring, dead, <laughs> terminal, linear, <laughs> Kronos. <laughs> So, so by anybody that runs for that is as good as dead. They, they turn into a pillar of salt. So, so you, yeah, the people that survive are people that can get into the weirdest, surreal situations and even enjoy it. <laughs> but anyway, they, this is nothing new. They've been doing this for thousands of years in like ashrams up in the Himalayas and if, if you go into a Zen ashram or a dojo <laughs> this is what they're doing they're doing this kind of one up and shit so we, we started the conversation off with um, you know how do we you know is there something that we we're missing on how we're reaching out to people or connecting with people and I wonder if this is this part is is part of it where we um, we have essentially a bit a, a lot of surreal like at the beginning we we have 
you know, some surreal music and and these kind of things. Um, it, do you think that's that we should meet people a little bit closer to where they are already, rather than you know doing kind of a purity test of can you handle the surreal? Yeah, that's that's what the AUG is. The AUG is really reaching out to them with just a little bit of mystery and then dragging them into the surreal. But you see, you can slice it a number of ways because I think, you know, the shit's coming. So my assumption is that the people will be coming in droves. I mean, the world will catch up and be surreal. You don't want to invest too much in, you know, recruiting people at the layer that they're in because that layer is moving so damn fast. So, so look what's happened in the last year. Think, think of 2019. So you start off with something that might appeal to people. People In 2019, people were really, really stuck in the mud. I mean, just doomerism was just, you know, out and out crazy shit. So, so you have to walk around there just, just to mention that you know, some bad shit could be coming around down the pike there already put you completely out on the lunatic fringe. Then in 2020, you know, now, now imagine that you invested in pretending that you weren't out on this and you, you, you softly, softly, you know, spend a year developing all the stuff and maybe chuck some money at it and and then you'd find, hang on, by 2020, already things are so surreal, the average Joe's <laughs> outdistanced you, and you're like, oh, now our stuff is a little bit too lame. Uh, you know, <laughs> you could chase after the situation. And I think that that's, that's where people are going to go. I mean, I think the same is with, with XR, is they, they're going to be overrun. They're already being overrun because they started in 2018 where they were appealing to people that were just getting a bit of little eco anxiety. Now they're already in a surreal place where most of the or most of the group that they're trying to appeal to their base is further ahead in doomism than they are. So they doing they started softly, softly, and they didn't want to even use the name Extinction Rebellion. People went nuts. Faulty told me the the mere mention he said that almost broke up the entire movement using the word extinction in the name. Now it's their biggest asset because you know, a couple of years later, every that's the top of everybody's mind. But you see how quickly the situation can change now. So the one moment you you completely beyond the bailiwick because you're saying that we're you know beyond fact, and the next thing you find yourself doing insulate Britain. And, and it's like a lot of people are saying, hang on, yeah, you know, this is about putting insulation in people's roofs in Britain. Don't you think we've got a lot more shit than this? <laughs> it's like, yes. But they're being strategic. They, they just, you know, it's not really about insulation. That's just an excuse. Um, but for the people that don't, don't know that, they kind of think, you know, hang on, we, we should be doing something much more drastic than this. <laughs> and um, so, so you kind of, so, so in answer, I think, you know, you've got to be careful what you invest in because the situation is going to change so fast now. Yeah, I think that's wise because we, uh, you kind of, it takes a while to get these sets of ideas uh, established into a shape that that's self-sustaining. And if you, um, if you're not like skating to where the puck is going to be, then uh, you'll miss it. Yeah, and I, I think that's the thing about preparing, say, text and things in advance, going over these, you know, doing these videos. We've got a big, quite a big base of stuff for people to get an introduction to. It's just not really organized. But I think if we anticipate where people come in, then they would be coming in as doomers just you know, this is the path we've all trodden. So, you know, we should prepare a prepare dinner for them and say, welcome to the tomb and feast, and here's the menu. And um, and so, you know, formalize it, you know, a guide for the recently doomerized kind of thing. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think that's that's the, the way to, to, to look at it because the there's an evolution in our in our interviews because we started recording um in lockdown already. You know, we were already under that uh, influence and the videos you made previously were were before. Uh so it will be it will be interesting if we can get people um to uh who have who have reached this point of doomerism but don't know where to look and are polarized by an anti-vax vax debate or a, a left right debate or a, you know green whatever just to, to something a little bit more huh, more rich you know and uh yeah and i don't think we need to go for numbers uh it's not that i think we need to we need to just uh, offer something offer something uh to the, the, the value i think that we're doing together uh to people who who want to who are interested and in, around us too because i i have actually uh i have i i have hesitated to to share some of our interviews with people because i think they haven't got an introduction and they're going to be thrown in the middle of a vocabulary and concepts and ideas and uh you know that that is not really that it might it might actually confuse them and put them off so if if we get into something a little bit more accessible um so i was thinking it would be a good idea that we we take an each of us take a an interview we could do that on the email group we could we could just decide which uh which uh, meeting we want to to kind of work on it would take too long and i don't know if a lot of us are very busy but i i would say that could take a, a few evenings to to just put together and and then we could uh, we could pull the results and see where we go from there yeah i like the sound of that I, yeah i think numbers are not important it's just just thinking through where the journey that we've each taken and just try and make it easier for other people so we've, we've blazed a bit of a trail and so um i think we have something to offer people that are just newly arrived uh, i think it's correct me if i'm wrong but my assumption is that when people become doomers they kind of confuse they the first thing is they're really pleased to find people that you know, A, they're not alone. So the first thing is to say, like, okay, you're not alone. Other people have figured this out and you're not going crazy. Oh, you probably are, but that's healthy. Uh, and then from there, um, I think what people want to know is how, how did this happen? How did we get here? Is there anything we can do about it? And you just basically you know, have a little, it's a sedative basically say, look, the Titanic's going down. <laughs> here let's uh read this book <laughs> so we'll explain the whole thing and then you know if we do our job right by the time the titanic goes down then we should be feeling you know hey you know it's it's okay i'm cool with this <laughs> wait a lot of the things that i'm trying to do is to just stop people running around screaming like punching crazy things in the final moment because i i see that i mean I have this horrible sense of doom hanging over me of, of what people are going to do, how nuts they're going to be when they realize. And so the great thing about it is you don't have to save the whole world. You don't have to say, you know, you just, you just let people that do come into contact with us know that, you know, that there are some people that know where it's going. <laughs> they, they, uh, they know where it's, um, you know, it, it, they're not completely freaked out about it. And um, they know that other people are going to lose their heads, but you don't have to. This can be really a lot better than, than the experience these other bastards are going to have. But the average bastard, I think, is going to have a very, very miserable experience. And I don't think it's necessary. You, you can actually have a beautiful experience. <laughs> You got to be careful because uh, you know it can be become a bit like Jim Bendel when you do deep adaptation Jim Jones style, which is not a cool way. I, I think those guys are going to do a crappy situation. You see, if you if you look closely at Jim Jones's videos, and they have recordings and stuff, 
actually what it was like to be in those environments. I'm, I'm not saying that Jim Jones and that is going to do metaphorical. I mean literal. These guys are on the literal path to the Kool-Aid experience. And and so if you look what those Kool-Aid experiences are, you don't want to be there. You don't, you don't want to go through the jungles in Guyana. You know, well, well, you time. know, I, I might have mentioned you this before. I might have mentioned this before, but um, and I, I've been aware of, of of this for quite for many many years. This, but I've been in my own little little sort of corner uh, preparing and thinking about it. But when it when it came to the point in in two thousand and seventeen eighteen that I really realized that we really effed. You know, um, I really thought at, up until then that there might be something and a bit at the same time as you actually, Hugh, because you you were doing your videos at the time and you got this kind of epiphany. And I, I got I got really scared and I got really nearly, you know, my fault, my, my mental health was going. I was, so I, I felt the need to reach out to a few people who were thinking the same way. And I, I found myself on the trail of those Jem Bendel groups and I attended a meeting with those people and I ran because I could feel what you're saying because they were going into well they were acknowledging the the side of, of that we need to grieve and that we need to do all these sort of you know whatever those bullshit sh stages are but they're they can be useful for some people that was fine but what I could see at the end is that there was a there was a kind of a yeah, kind of a religious, uh, cultish type of thing that was emerging, and the sort of this sort of a darkness. I could, I, I couldn't put words onto it. I, I literally left the place and to never go back. I went to that meeting in an echo village here, where they had invited friends of Jem Bendel and his group, uh, the Deep Adaptation Forum, and they were all. It was, it was scary, and I think that if people. When people start to come to terms with with our fate, if they're if they're met with these sort of people, it's it's just terrible. And if we can only do offer to to a few people another another perspective, because you know, and that's how after that that's when I met when I when I talked to you and I started to to to, to interact with with you and then my Gary and, and all the group and I started to say, okay, that's sanity now. Uh, you know, but I, I I really had that experience, and I can tell you, it's a lot of people could go down that that way. I'm, very many. I'm glad you 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 feel it. I I mean, for me too, it's just this indescribable feeling. It's nightmarish for me, but just just the sound of Jimbo. Jim ben, Bendel's voice and the the writing and stuff. It just curdles my blood. I mean, I, I just know where they're going. I, and I, it's just so fucking creepy. And they can't see it. They think they're all being nice and positive and stuff. And I was like, they like, dudes, don't do this, man. It's just horrible. It's, I, I feel physically revulsed. It's just, oh, I want to vomit. But you but see, they're, they're, the only they've, given, they've given away the, the, the rebellion, the sense of fight, the sense of standing up. That that's what it is, and and there's some fantastic people among around him. Like I've read a lot of, I've read the books of Charles Eisenstein and all these people who gravitate in that sort of thing. And I'm not, I'm not condem condemning these people. I'm not saying, but there's this kind of, yeah, there's don't, they don't fight anymore. It's, it's almost they indefinable. Fight. Yeah, it's yeah. indefinable. But it it's 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 good. It's it's not evil. It's um, it's uh, what, what's the word? It's it's weird. So it's it's um, kind of uncanny and hor horrible. It's unnatural. So yeah, the, the only way I can really express it, it <clears throat> those guys are not dying ripe. I mean, I think the the way is, you know, to die ripe, and <clears throat> that's um, then if you're talking about dying ripe, then we. We all have to die eventually, and we. So it's all about knowing that you have to die. You know, how do you live a good life? And it, it hardly changes at all the Duma situation. It just underlines it. So, 
you know, it's kind of like McPherson says, we're not in any new situation. When, once at some point in your doomerism, you realize, well, you know, we all doomed individually. And so now this is, we, we're all just doomed collectively. <laughs> so it's like, it's not a huge difference. I mean, I, I, I really, it really hit me pretty hard in 2018 when I realized that we all do. But the, the, um, you know, once you get over that, you're pretty much in the position everybody's been in that's ever lived on this planet. So the same rules apply. And then what those guys are doing, Jim Bandal and that, that's, that's evil and not evil. That's not the right word, but it's, it's deviant. It's, um, I can't, can't think of the word that I'm grappling for, but it's, it's horror. It's a nightmare. What, what those guys are doing. It's, it, what, what's the word? What's the word? It's not, it's unnatural. It's um, it's aberrant. It's, yeah, it's a it's an aberration, but it's it's oh macabre. I think what they're yeah, doing. But it doesn't is, help. Yeah, it doesn't help macabre. people. It doesn't help people at all. They 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 offer what a psychotherapist would offer, more or less. They offer all sorts of things like that. They also. Um, from what I see, a lot of them are uh, behind this men green mentality. You know, uh, some of them are in favor even of geoengineering. Some of them are are, are behind, uh, uh, very strongly behind wind turbines and and uh, solar panels and all this kind of personal responsibility that you were mentioning earlier. Recycle, reuse it. They do not. Uh, there's not many people in there that re question that question our whole history, our system, um, why we came, wh why we came here as human beings. They don't. That that our system is a given for them. For a lot of them, not all of them. And I'm not saying that everything is wrong. You know, in in deep adaptation, there there is certainly some individuals who are doing a great job. I I know some of them who are trying to help some young people who are on that. A sub called the uh, collapse support because some people in there are going totally ballistic and i am there's a couple of them in the states who are who are doing kind of who try to help them to to get over the first stages of all this but okay the first stages but what comes after you know and then they channel them into these kind of groups that have this thing that you can't put a word on but i i can understand what you mean because i felt it in my guts i i couldn't put a word on it it just, I took my, I took my car and I ran, I do you know, I just ran, never went back near them again. And I was very vulnerable at the time. So well, I, 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 I was also, you know, it was like, oh. Hmm. Yeah, um, I fear for people that go again that over. Yeah, that's, that's a challenge because uh, there's less mental distance to travel uh, to get to their camp. Um, because if if you haven't already, um, you know, started to question pretty much everything in the prison yard, then it it it's a much quicker shortcut to just add that new piece of information of doomer doomerism, and and then and then you're sucked into that. Because for me, it was very disorienting to have every handhold and every bit of certainty that I've ever held almost be undermined. Um, and, uh, to, to have to just be in a vacuum with no handholds, um, for a while, while, um, you know, trying to figure out what, you know, the, you know, everything that I'd learned in school, everything that, that my society or my, my peers or my parents had, um, you know, hold to be held to be self-evident or just so far off that. It, it was hard to really, um, you know, it, you, you just constantly are finding yourself like reaching for those things that, that you know aren't real anymore to try to make sense of what you're looking at. And then you have to like put that back down. It's like, um, so it's, it's, a, it's similar to coming out of a, a religion or something where you're, you're deprogramming yourself, you're, you're trying to, you know, recontextualize everything you encounter, um, and uh, and the the sad part is that it is 
emotionally much less satisfying on the other side, <laughs> like so far. Like um, the like, I, I I envy people sometimes who have um, have a internally like coherent worldview that makes sense to them and and uh, is simple and they have answers for all their questions and stuff. Like it it must be nice, <laughs> right? Um, but you know it's it's not going to serve them long term. But it's and that's where the risk is is that those are the people who are going to be running around with their heads cut off uh, when everything collapses, when all of that collapses in one moment instead of over a longer period of time. But yeah, I wish I could have something, you know, uh, better than, than hope to give those people. Um, <laughs> something a little more uh, emotionally satisfying. And more fun to I mean, more, less, I mean, doom, doom, being a doomer doesn't mean that you, you don't have fun. You don't, you know, you don't see the joy and all that. And that's what I felt too in these circles. It was like turning into a cult of death. It was so horrible. Yeah. But they seem to be anti-life to me. So... You know, you hold on to some principles as a doom, and one of them is life. Makes you happy, and seeing the fishes and the birds and the and the house makes you happy. And I think that oh, you know, these flowers will soon be gone. Oh, those birds will soon be dry. So nice sight, man. It, but they, you know, they, after a while, it, it, I get the impression that if you suddenly see something, it's actually an easy solution to climate change. And here's the game on my hand. I just have to flick the switch. I, I think they would rip that out of your hand and smash your head because they're so glued up for this, this grand ending <laughs> that they wouldn't want to be disappointed, right? If you, if you could now fix the world, they would hate you. <laughs> So I, I think it's so wrong. But 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 Ryan, I don't feel that those guys who have all the answers, I don't envy them at all because I think it's very hard work. You see, what I think beneath the surface, there's massive cognitive dissonance, and they feel that all the time. They they are fragmented because there's there's no you know they know to be a person like that, you are confronted repeatedly with this terror in the in the corner that uh, confront, confronts the fact that you you uh, you have these cognitive dissonances that you, you're kind of faking your way and whistling through the graveyard and you're always reminded of that fact and so they continually have to work and work and work and I think it's eating away at their souls so I um, yeah I, I don't envy that at all I think the better way is is to you know step back and realize you know a you don't have control b it's very complex um see there's there's no answers and you get more once you get comfortable with that you start to see a real beauty in them you, you start to step through the looking glass and realize that i would be absolutely terrifying most of these things that people are talking about are absolutely horrid if you actually think them through i mean just think of scientists where they think, yeah, soon we'll have a theory of everything. Science is, will soon be complete. It's not infinite. We'll soon know everything and then close the book. It's like, what are you talking about? That was, that's a horrible dead-end world. You mean everybody that, you know, went in science would be just studying history after that? And then, like, Einstein would be, you know, the one of the late great guys that were just missed the final thing you'd have some twat like ed witten would be the ultimate brain of the universe that came up with a formula that unified everything in a theory of everything it's horrible horrible world it's like the end of history the end of science and it's like i and once you realize that you think it's fucking pleasure that you don't know that it's a continual unfolding this then you get point where you, where it's kind of like being married 
to this endlessly fascinating, endlessly never-ending universe. <laughs> it's a completely different world. And it's, it's healthy, it's happy, <laughs> it's, it's lively, and you celebrate each new twist and turn of life. You don't, you don't want these, these terminator things like heaven. I mean, think through what heaven must be like. An eternal, eternal heaven where you walk through these pearly gates and then you have to sit at the right hand or the left hand of the father. He's a fucking psychopath. He's done genocide after genocide. Can you imagine sitting at the table until eternity? It's like, think this heaven idea through. It's the worst nightmare you could possibly. This is like imaginary psychopath in the sky that you spend forever with. And it's like, yeah, you'll meet your family, uh, you know, up there, and then you'll be, it's like, it's like really? <laughs> you, you know what that's going to be like? It's not going to be as pleasant as you well, think. <laughs> well, that, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's like, that's but, very, that reflects very much the, you know, the, the notion of a traumatized person who who doesn't want to to, to see his, his trauma and who completely bargains, who, who tries to stay in the situation until until you see until you realize that you are traumatized until you really really get there and you you take action against it you you would you would be a prisoner it's the same thing with with the the, the lockdowns i can't i i've got those a lot of people who have been oh so afraid are so against lockdowns it's not the right way to do it doesn't matter they were very useful they showed people that there's a before and after and you can see now people saying Oh, we'd like to go back to normal, and that's when you can tell you can start to tell them. Look at what was normal. What do you define by normal? Is dysfunctional normal? And that again goes back to the trauma thing. When you've lived in a, in a traumatizing situation, family, or you you think dysfunction is the norm. So you know it's it it goes back to what you say, uh, Ryan. I mean, you'd like to see everything, you know not as it is because you are still under the spell of the trauma but once you once you start to heal that once you start to get out of that narrative and you suddenly see you suddenly get free of all this that's when the crack starts that when you start to have fun that's when you start to be a happy doomer yep exactly i think um there's another thing about you know the the macabre nature of the that other group um, and I think is is something we don't learn about very much in our culture. We, we're very averse to death itself. And there's that that you know their macabre version, but then there's kind of a, a different, more natural version of death. Something I learned from uh, I was watching this uh, documentary called The Biggest Little Farm, and it was it, I recommend everybody watch it because it's it's kind of interesting, but. Um, for sustainable farming or whatever, but uh, the the interesting thing is that all of the different ways of making it sustainable involved in introducing species that would cause other species to die, right? So you have a big swarm of snails all over the fruit trees, and so you introduce the ducks to go and eat the snails, and then the 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 um, uh, and the you know, there's flies everywhere. So you have chickens that go and eat the fly, the maggots out of the, you know, the everything. And, um, you know, it, you have the owls that go and swoop and, and get the gophers and whatever. And it's uh, when you get enough of that complexity, it'll it'll start to balance a little bit um, where you don't have to do so much work. And I was realizing, like, we're just the the whole thing I was looking at I was saying this is just a mass like genocide of all these like um, various species but when you have enough genocide on every side like it starts to create a real like death as a as a form of life and I think the difference is that um, with with life it it turns uh, uh, it it turns living things into other living things. Whereas with our, our society, we turn living things into dead things and it, they stay that way, right? And I think that w if yeah. we are to cope with death, um, I think we need to redefine it. 
and um, and to to forge a new relationship with it. And I think, I mean, speaking of Cobb, I'm, the the people in the Black Death and folks like that, they they had a you know some somewhat of a, a playful friendship with with uh, the Grim Reaper in a way, and um, you know the the Day of the Dead in in Mexico and things like that, where where it's a it's a different kind of relationship to death than than our Becker style fear of it. Yeah, so that's what I was trying to do with um, uh, the Darwin was wrong series because the is it's really that idea of Darwinism is not quite right, and it's it's it creates this idea that there's a terminal winner and loser class and this war of all against all. But it's not what I knew from when I grew up in Africa. You know, I was out in the felt all the time and living in nature. And the overall sense that you got was of everything being continually reused. So you never, you would see dead things all the time, but whenever you saw them, they were in the process of being recycled by millions of other living things. So you, you had this idea um, you know, of this, what, what those people I think that are doing that kind of ecological farming is doing is they're create, creating an ecosystem, artificial ecosystem. They're just reinventing it and learning what an ecosystem is. But in Africa, you've got a clear sense of that ecosystem and you, there's no kind of tragedy in, in dying because it's kind of recycling into the next living thing. And nature, you know, the you, the overall impression you get of nature is not of a war of all against war, war and survival of the fittest and all this expensive kind of thing. There's the 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 major thing that you you got uh, was the that the nature's always vacuuming up and recycling, and they, it's it's always hoovering up. There's never any waste for very long. Something takes something else. And so it's, it's not a question of things being killed. It's not a big um, slaughterhouse. You see, everything's being tested. Uh, and so I think more in terms of living things are things that are Kantian holes and they, they continually reinforce themselves. So the whole, they are living things that are fine. There's things that, you know, the whole uh, supports the parts and the parts support the whole. But it, it's always being tested. So all the time, in the ecosystem, you're always being bitten by things and have things, you know, they're always testing you to see, are you still alive? Because they all want, you know, if you're not alive and you're not really supporting yourself healthily and the bits are not supporting the, 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 the you know, the whole and the whole isn't supporting the parts, then then it's what a, it's a new, you see, the whole ecosystem is also a Kantian whole. And so the other insects biting you and testing you and just, you know, that you, you're continually brushing things off. And living animals are doing that all the time. They're always having ticks and parasites and flies and worms. And you always stroking them off or washing or licking or rolling in the dirt. And that's, you know, a way of saying that, hey, no, this, this little, this little Kantian hole is still functional. If it's if it's if it breaks down and becomes dysfunctional, it gets taken up by the bigger Kantian hole. Because each those ants and stuff biting you and wasps and stuff, they they not uh, like an attacking force, you know, an army against an army in this huge battle. They they are parts of the bigger hole. They just you know. Think of them like organs of a bigger organism. And that you get such a strong sense of that. It, it, when, if you've been out in the wild as like a real hunter-gatherer, that I, I'm absolutely certain all these guys are fucking psychopaths, all the guys like Malthus and, and Darwin and stuff. And what, what their signature trait is they come from a city. They Over and over again, you can see they don't understand nature. And when you watch a nature documentary, you always see this classic thing, anything to do with Darwin. You see, you know, this lion hunting down an antelope. And why? Because they they cherry picking this one iconic bit of predator-prey relationships. And that it's 
it's completely bogus because if you if you lived in Africa like I did, is people would go to the game reserves obsessed with going to the bush and the game reserve and stuff, and they spend every moment of every holiday in the bush and then the game reserve and stuff. And so they spend something was like three months or even the whole year in the bush. They could go their whole fucking lives and never see a lion bring down an antelope. And that's the that's the signature thing that they want you to say. It's always like this. It's always the Serengeti years lions. It's like you you'll never see a lion bringing down an antelope. You go to Africa and you you see a kill on the African plane. I'll give you a fucking gold medal. So it's they're taking the most obscure, fringe, marginal uh, behavior out right on a limb. It's completely freakish, um, and and then you know ig ignoring what you see. You know the guys who are taking those those pictures. They wait months and months and months and to to get you know years sometimes to get a kill like that. And in the meantime, they're swatting flies and things are eating them, and it never occurs to them. Well, that's really what what's happening is nature's vacuuming and testing all the time. So you know, the, so what I was trying to say with the Darwin thing is is really reestablishing this idea of life and the fact that we've you know isolated ourselves from it so that now everybody gets cremated. You, you don't even get you're not even allowed to be go back to be worm food and get back into the system. You you have to be decomposed into your constituent elements. And then, you know, once that's sanitized and turned into ash, then, you know, your relatives are allowed to go and sprinkle it in some garden. But, you know, it's basically potash at that, that stage. Is they, they reduced you to the lowest rung of that ecosystem. So you're only really good for plant nutrients once, once you've been, you know, turned into ash. But, you know, if, if they put your whole body there, you you would be fucking useful right up the food chain, right to the top, <laughs> right right to if a, you know if you died and they did a, like a sky burial, like everybody's horrified with the sky burials at Gebeki Tepe and you know, mm. Tibet and stuff. But it's like these guys were you can see how they were thinking. They were thinking, well, this is not the end of you. This is well, it was the first deviation of healthy thinking. But at very least, they were thinking that the these predatory birds, um, scavengers, were you were going back into nature. They're going off the deep end because they're thinking the birds are taking you up to some celestial realm where you'll you know, have eternal life, where you have rebirth. So you can see they're getting a bit fucked up on the death anxiety. But if they, you know, if they still have the healthy idea that you, know, you need to be fed back into the ecosystem and that's to be celebrated. <laughs> I mean, it's it's nice, isn't it? A nice thought to think that you'd be your body would be become useful shit for African animals. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's it's not hard even for a Westerner to get there, is it? But it's so to actually embalm somebody or something to make sure that they couldn't be eaten by worms. It says everything about our. A psychological sickness. And when I was when I was up in the in the mountains in uh, in the Himalaya, I met with some some an old Tibetan um, refugee who was a, a healer there, and he was telling me the same thing. He said he said that in his country uh, they used to bring the bodies up in the hills for the birds to the dead bodies for the birds to feed on them, but not only did they do that, but afterwards. They used to go up and grind the bones with stones into tiny little particles so that it would be either used again on the little fields they had or down and put in the water or whatever. So every part of the of the bodies were used. And he said, it's not like what they do. The Hindus look at them using precious wood to burn all those bodies on the shores of the rivers. And 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 that's a, such a waste, <laughs> you know. Isn't that a terrible waste? I mean, and, and then, and not only that, then they had to do sati, where the, the, the wife has to jump into the fire too, otherwise her life's not worth living. It's like, what a sick fucking bunch we are. So you notice the connection, the guys in India, all of us and stuff, it's the Aryans. 
always comes back to the Aryans. Someone went wrong with them and their, their fear of death. So that's kind of what I'm writing about with the five legged brains thing. Aren't the Zoroastrians uh, Aryan too? And they did sky burial? Yep. They, you see, but all of them are, are Manichaeans and they, they're dualists. And they see everything in black and white. It's you can that black and white is is the the thing that becomes Kronos and becomes computing and becomes Leibniz's monads and zeros and ones. It's, it's zeros and ones, black and white, <laughs> yin and yang. As soon as they start thinking that way, they're getting a bit fucked up because they're oversimplifying what nature is. And then that that. That becomes uh, the whole in the zero and one. I I said this to Petra last uh, week, week before, but um, yeah, maybe I'll just say this and then end off, and then somebody wants to say something. But in terms of understanding Kronos. Uh, or artificial intelligence uh, is uh, you have to go back to Leibniz. Leibniz is a good starting point. And Leibniz uh, was obsessed by uh, this kind of mathematical theology that he was doing. And he, he got down to basic principles and said in terms of very much a Pythagorean, Pythagorean thing or Wheeler's it for bit or, you know, now physicists say everything is information, but anyway, this idea of information and this idea that everything was numbers from Pythagoras. So starting from that pre premise, Leibniz thinking, you know, God and number are the same thing. So he says, okay, you have an empty universe. Well, you can't do any counting because it's a zero, it's, you know, represented by the Hindu zero, no, nothing. So there's nothing going on. It's an empty universe. And so to make something out of nothing, then you need God or one. So you, you need some tiny difference, whatever difference it is, you need something and its opposite. Otherwise you can't have anything. And so that's pretty much what Western science is now. It's, um, you know, it's basically you need some black and white. So now it's very interesting that when Leibniz came up with this, he came up with digital or binary arithmetic pretty much and he, he had he he thought of it in terms he got very mystic about it you know saying like if you look at binary seven is uh, three so it's three one so he went you know that's the trinity and he, he went off into this real theology and and um and he 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 made this medallion with zeros and ones saying that this is the ultimate way of all numbers can be represented by these fundamental differences zero and one and the computer is based on that and Artificial intelligence is based on that thinking. Here's why, where he went wrong. This is where it's interesting. He's looking at it from a point of view of black and white. So he's saying, at the very least, to have a universe, you have to have something and nothing. It's not right. It's an oversimplification. What he was doing at the time when he came up with this horseshit is he was looking at the I Ching. So they got the I Ching from China. And they were thinking of ways of how can they convince these Taoist heathens and atheists, um, how can they convert them to Christianity by smart arguments? And so they, he was studying the I Ching. He got very excited because, you know, 64 was great for, for binary arithmetic and the I Ching is all about 64 and all. And they had, in fact, a binary notation in a way for the I Ching. But here's the thing. They had a big yin and yang symbol. And then he, he was like, yeah, black and white, zero and one, you know, yin and yang, this Manichaean thing, all of this. Um, and so he thought that's that was the essence, and that's why he got so excited about it. But he didn't look closely enough, and that's the problem with all of these fucking <laughs> knob jockey transhumanists. Is the is that the yin and yang symbol, if you look closely, it has black in the white and white in the black. So it's saying it's not zero and one. You cannot have empty space. In every bit of empty space, you'll find something. 
And you cannot have a one. That's the essence of what they're doing is they're thinking too monolithically. So a one will also have space in it. You, you, information does not exist in the abstract. Computer programmers are fucked in the head if they think that. Computer information has to be reified. And as soon as you reify it, you're in the deepest problem known to man because there's not nothing without little elements of something. There is a quantum froth if you want to go in that route or whatever, but you cannot have nothing. There's no vacuum. Okay. And there isn't anything that's solid one. There isn't anything that's solid matter. It also has the elements of space in it. And that's what they said in the Yin Thang thing, but Leibniz missed it. But here's the thing. I think the Taoists were also wrong because that little black spot in the white and that little white spot in the back is they missed the trick. What that is, is it's another yin and yang symbol. So it's in, in the white. It's not a black spot. It's another yin and yang. So in other words, it's involuted. It's an infinite regress. You, in that white spot on the black or black spot on the white, you will find that it's another yin and yang symbol. It too will have a black spot and infinite all the way down. And that's what the universe is saying. Because if you think about it, if you can't have a vacuum, it will always have elements of something. Then, then you can have a look at that something, and the same rule applies. It'll have elements of nothing. So it's fractal. The universe is fractal all the way down. So it is the Taoists are wrong, and Leibniz is wrong. And that's why AI is wrong. It's, it's saying that things are something or nothing, zero, one, black and white. Saying no, that you they're fractal you can't you can't say that and, that, and it, you know this sounds like kind of abstract and stuff no this is why we're going extinct this is why there's co2 up in the atmosphere this is why they're going to do geoengineering and this is why geoengineering is going to kill us because it's not black and white you cannot measure things numerically when they try and do geoengineering they will find a measurement problem you cannot measure. And that's why AI isn't isn't AI. Because everybody, you know, the human brain is is squidgy, fractal thing. And it'll always be out, able to outrun a thing that can only do this or that. Ipso facto. So a lot of people said this, man. Take a guard. All these guys said it. And nobody can fucking hear them. And so the prices of the stupidity is going extinct. Anyway, anybody want to say anything else after that? But anyway, it's the same. You know, Jim Bendel, all those guys, life or death? Cake or death? <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's not life or death. <laughs> we just, if you have a look at all those those dead things being eaten up by ants and worms and birds and things on it. It's like, is this thing living or dead? Ah, neither. See, if you go and look in a forest, you say, like, we got obsessed with saying, you know, this is a healthy forest, this is not a healthy forest, these are live trees, these are dead trees. This is when it's like, no. It was a beautiful bit of, of woodland just where I lived in Seattle. And I'd go walking <laughs> every lunchtime. And the, so in that forest, it was a real rainforest. So, so not a lot of people know this, but some of the last pristine rainforests in the world actually up in the Northwest <laughs> in, uh, in America. But anyway, this was a little slice of it. And it's a it's fucking amazing thing because all the trees, they have square roots. They have literally, literally, I mean, it's like the joke out of uh, the Disney cartoon with Donald Duck in that magic land. They literally have square fucking roots. <laughs> so you say, why? And the reason is because nobody's logging it. it. It is a healthy forest, right? So even the guys say, oh, when the, you know, when a tree falls down dead, then we can take it out. No, it's, that's not how forests work. There are no dead trees in the forest. The reason why they have square roots is because when a log falls down, it becomes a nurse log. Before, it's not really dead. The, it becomes the nursery for, it's literally called a nursery log. It becomes the nursery and little, little seedlings fall on it. 
they use you know the chitin and the the the, the cellulose which we call dead and we say the phylum is alive it's not dead other trees can use it and the little seedlings put their roots down and their roots wrap around the old log and everybody uses all that cellulose for the new life for the new trees and then when you know the the log rots away and everybody's used it it has square square roots where the, the old log or the stump or whatever used to be and so that's what a, a healthy forest looks like it has all this you know these trees have these strange square holes in them and that's because that's where nurse logs used to be now if you start logging a forest like that and you take those logs out then you know all these foresters and ecologists walk through this and they say well look at this this is a very healthy forest managed by german engineering and you say no it's a fucking decrepit unhealthy distorted fucking horror of a forest why they're not nurse logs you know if if a tree that falls down in germany now they auction it off basically big monies and they call it sustainable no, it's just more sustainable than the bullshit you were doing before, which we called forest management. <laughs> but, but it too, it basically you've gone from a 100-year healthy lifespan and then the forest is all dead. And say, so, okay, we've got over that. Took us 100 years, but brilliant geniuses now. Now you only take the logs out when they're dead. Well, great, so now you've got to a 500-year forest. How do you get a sustainable forest? You you stop fucking doing all that management you fucking turd burglars god almighty this is not difficult guys but it's difficult if you have this idea of life death and <laughs> he was like saying that ah uh, well anyway that binary idea that manichaean idea came from the Aryans, and i think it it's probably deeper than that it goes into the genes of white people and i think probably what it is is something to do with a a failed hybridization between Neanderthals and cro magnums And anyway, unless anybody has anything to say about that, then maybe we should end it there. Sorry, what, what did you say? Uh, 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 it's, uh, at the end, you said it's a, there's a lack of what? Because there was the transmission wasn't good. It's, between you said it, there's a lack probably of... A, it's probably a failed hybridization between cro magnums and Neanderthals all right okay it's my guess because because, because it, it exists, exists in white, white people it's, it's a, a white, white people problem, problem. What, the, our disease of the brain that leads us to want to control and every last second every last molecule and electron we can't let go it is like i don't uh, yeah <laughs> But it seems like that's the yeah the essence of it. We just can't let the go. Control control control. Control. Yeah, the, the yen for control comes from fear of death. So it's it's like see if you imagine a critter getting eaten by ants in my youth in the African felt. Uh, if you see that and it horrifies you, you think. Oh, I don't want to get eaten up like that. Well, you're thinking that that thing's dead, and you're looking on that thing with a kind of Jem Bindel horror. But the healthy way to look at it is say, I want to die like that, because I'm living in all those little other animals. <laughs> in a in way, way, I'm giving life to them. To them. Yes. But you can't, you can't get, get to that, to that thought, thought if you if you get to scared of death. It's that city thing again. It's the divorce, our divorce from nature. It's uh, yeah, it's total. But we, but can't, we can't. We can't just say, "Oh, we need to heal it and go back to, you know, heal the connection to nature and so It's it it doesn't cut it until you get over that psychology of death. So once you're not scared of death, then you're not scared of nature anymore and that heals the connection but it, what all these people are running around doing saying is we must get back to nature we must be and it's more this kind of binary thinking in nature out of nature it's like 
you're really not out of nature even in the city you're just in a shitty part of nature <laughs> yeah, yeah the the ecosystem is still in the city there's still pigeons and rats and cats and shit like that it's it's just a very shitty part of an ecosystem so yeah we don't have to get back to nature and stuff we just have to heal the psychology <laughs> And, and the, the healing the psychology means getting over our fear of death. And the way you get over your fear of death is wisdom. And what's the wisdom? The wisdom is that it's over this idea that you're an individual that dies. And it's, it's like that. and lives through all and we're just one of them. So it's not so incredible. <laughs> it's fucking obvious once once it out. But tell this Yeah, I hope you feel Your, your signal was really patchy at the end. We can't hear you. But anyway, let's finish there. <laughs> Missed a lot of that. Well, sometimes I think that um sliding back. I kind of think what I what I said there was really useful. And so they react, man. The internet will try and stop you. I'm not surprised I broke up with that. It's trying to stop you now. Yeah, it's trying to stop you. Yeah. Okay. Well. Well. Okay. Let's give in to Kronos. We don't want to fight a head-to-head -head battle. So let's just fall still. Close your eyes. Feel the stillness. Know that the stillness is not death. The stillness is the background to life. And life is background to death. Om Paramatma Nenama, okay. Well, I hope we've still got some connection enough to uh, say, say goodbye. goodbye. Yeah, goodbye. Thanks very much. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And, and bye. 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 B